Because you're like, oh, these people care about what I have to say and what I want to do. Yeah. And there's freedom, which is paralyzing. It, it, it is paralyzing when you're your own boss, you're doing your own thing. The big misconception is like, money and value are the same. Like, where money flows, mm -hmm. it's flowing to the places that, you know, members of society value the mm -hmm. most. And that the price of something determines its value, or like how much money someone's made over their lifetime is how much value they've contributed. Right. And like decoupling those two ideas and really realizing that they couldn't be more disconnected. You could have your own daisy pillow. If you want it, that's very comforting. It is comforting, you know. In case you get nervous. Daisy. Oh, we're on. We're yeah, rolling. Yeah, we're just rolling. Oh my goodness! I can't show my stomach on film. <laughs> I can't do it. I'm not wearing anything under this. Just okay. straddling the daisy. Classic. All right, Jessica. Thank you so much for coming on. Actually, let me close Should the, I door. the door. What am I doing? I got it. Slay. Thank you. I work here. Thank you. Now look how quiet it is. <laughs> <laughs> Just attacks. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we'll be for real now. We'll be for real now, especially because we have like 40 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much for coming on Days at Night. You were a hard get. For the I was a hard get. I was expensive. Just, I was just in her house and I came downstairs. And I said, guess what? You're we're on gonna, camera. We're going to talk in a microphone now. <laughs> we're going to talk in a microphone. Pay the toll for staying at my house. Yeah. <laughs> Get on camera, Jessica. It was actually my idea. It was actually Jessica's idea. I was like, you idea. know, I can hop on and just talk shit. I'll and I was like, oh, my deepest secrets for this you. This is awkward because she's in my house. I can't tell her no. You know, we're yeah. friends. No, I'm kidding. Obviously, I wanted Jessica on the pod anyway. And you're eventually, you're coming out with a pod soon as well. Right? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Hopefully. Oh. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. So, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself for those of you who are unfamiliar? Well, my most important identity is that I'm friends with Daisy. Absolutely. Of course. Um, and Same. I also talk into a microphone for a living. You do? If that's something that I do now. It's very weird. I never thought that I would do that. I don't know. I never thought it was a job, the job that I have now. I studied political science and international studies. But I grew up working class, and I never liked politics, so I didn't even think I would do that. And so now I, you're all politics. My life's been a series <laughs> of accidents, and that led me to where I am now, really. Uh, failing upward? I guess, yeah. <laughs> it kind of feels like that. That's how I feel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do media. I mean, there's not a lot of working people in media, and I never mm -hmm. studied to be a journalist. I studied public policy. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the world's pretty messed up. Like, growing up in the financial crisis, I went to trade school. Mm -hmm. I was in one of those working-class families where when it hit, things got really bad. Mm -hmm. And it's so weird because we grew up just outside of Manhattan, like, a th within 30 miles of the city. And so my dad would, like, make houses in Fairfield County for all of the bankers and investors that worked on Wall Street, yeah. right? He was a carpenter. And he could build houses with his own two hands, but we struggled to keep our own. And the bankers that bailed were bailed out completely. Yeah. Uh, they were fine. And I was like, this is messed up. Like, something's not right. Uh, my friend Natalie made me do, like, debate and mock trial and stuff. So after trade school, I ended up going to college. And from there, it was just kind of like a bunch of accidents of, like, I, like, I was very curious about how to fix a lot of the problems we have. And then I realized that they're there by design. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, like oh. I'm just going to tell everyone now. Yeah. And that's going to be my job. So and that now that's how I'm here. You can circumvent what you went through where you were like, yeah. what's up with this? And now you can be like, it's actually not an accident. It's on purpose. Yeah. That everything's all messed up. I made a career out of talking shit. Yeah, you about did. About rich people. Yes, you did. Yeah. And where did you go to school? I went to undergrad at Wells College, which mm -hmm. is a tiny school of 500 kids. Um, they gave me scholarships for leadership. Mm -hmm. And I probably wouldn't have gone to college if they didn't. But, so I got lucky. And then I went to Brown for graduate school. So um an intellectual queen yeah it was a good time um a scary time mm -hmm. and i think it becomes very obvious that there's like you know a lot of people there that shouldn't be you're talking about legacy students yes what do you i, I was am. gonna ask you about that so since like obviously context i did not go to an ivy league school i went to theater school and then i dropped out to have spinal surgery and then i i started to try and get into like the stem space i started multidisciplinary studies and was trying to switch 
because I'm like an inventor also. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I'll work on my patents. Yeah. You know, and then I was like, this sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I dropped out of college. I still got my patents though, but I dropped out of college. So like I'm coming from like the totally different educational background where like you're an academic, you're killing it. And I am not an academic. And yet we both do very similar things online where mm -hmm. we're very, we're information based. And so it's yeah. like interesting. We're like two sides of the same coin. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's weird because like so many people have an idea about what they want to be, what mm -hmm. they want to do when they're young. And then they find out the economy is not really set up in a way to do that in a positive yeah. way. So like I studied public policy. A lot of what you do with that degree mm -hmm. is you help write policy. Mm -hmm. But no one wants to write good policy right now. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the people that are in Congress are lobbied to pass certain policies. They're paid. I like to say that, like, whenever you see a member of Congress on cable news, mm -hmm. it's like a commercial for all of the lobbyists. They're yeah. like, oh, like, we're very upset about how conglomerated the baby formula industry is, which is really them saying, like, name your price. There's a lobbyist watching, like, oh, yeah, I got to buy that guy. Yeah. Uh, and it's crazy that that's how it works. So there was really nowhere for me to go after grad school that I felt mm -hmm. good about going and, like, helping make policy and do right. research. Right, because you don't want to be a part of the problem. No. Yeah. I was like, what am I going to go do? Write neoliberal policy for yeah. these guys that That's make it half seem okay. like they're trying to address the problems? Yeah. I was like, I don't want to be a part of that. So I worked for the Bernie campaign and I took a huge pay cut and it was mm -hmm. great. And I was just knocking doors and like talking to working people about the problems in our society. And there's like this idea that you have to do that. You have to like go talk to people and be grassroots. Yeah. And then I started posting on TikTok in the pandemic after the campaign because I was like talking to everyone every day and then no one. Yeah. I was like, I'm, I miss like, I gotta get it out. Yeah. I have still have feel passionate about this. I'm yeah. gonna talk to you guys. Right. And so that's what I did. And then I was like, oh, sh can I swear? Yeah, you can swear. Okay. I was like, oh, shit. I'm reaching way more people here yeah. than I could in a day. And then I was like, this is really where it's at. This is where you can share ideas and meet yeah. people on the internet. And it is. Yeah. You, you have the broadest reach. It's crazy. Like, it is crazy. And yeah. then now you're trying to figure out like what your next move is. You're like, Am I going to be committing to the news space? Am I going to be committing to the creator space? Am I going to find, like, my halfway point in between? Mm -hmm. It's hard. Because mm -hmm. you're like, oh, these people care about what I have to say and what I want to do. Yeah. And there's freedom, which is paralyzing. It, it It is paralyzing when you're your own boss. You're doing your own thing. Especially, like, I know we're both ADHD queens. It's like... I'm a bad boss and a bad employee. I know. And I'm, then you got to be both. So it's working like, for myself is a nightmare. You're like looking in the mirror like, you need yeah. to be on time. And it's like, it's so hard when there's no one to hold me accountable yeah. but me. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I want to make a skit. Or do I want to write a research article for my sub stack? Yeah. Uh, it's very hard. It's very hard. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just doing what I like doing is important. Because I found myself like, I have to do you know, news videos. Yeah. And it's like, but I would rather do a satirical skit. And I'm just kind of learning that wherever my energy is, is where I have to go. You partially taught me this. Yeah. We've talked about that a lot. Yeah. That, that TikTok kind of decides what you're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> like you can't force yourself to do stuff you don't want to do because mm -hmm. you're not going to do a good job. Yeah. TikTok will tell you like, Hey, this is doing a good job yeah and then you'll try and recreate it and you'll be like huh the results like weren't the same what the fuck mm -hmm. and it's just because like were you were you trying to shoehorn your way into that part too that's a yeah. trap that a lot of people fall into and so you have to like sometimes you can't you can't film for like a few days just because you're you're yeah. not in the right energy it's a you have to have like a charisma through the screen Mm -hmm. You know, even when you're talking, actually not even, especially when you're talking about the things that you talk about that are generally subjects that people yeah. shy away from because it's intimidating topics, it's intense things that af affect the real world, politically, economically, mm -hmm. especially when you get into economics, you do an especially good job breaking down economics for people who are kind of freaked out by those conversations. Thank you. Yeah, you do. You really do because like I don't have a brain for that kind of thing at all. And when I watch your videos, I'm like, yeah. That is how it works, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm like, totally. I know, and I compare it to other people. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, my friend Jessica and I were just discussing. It's like <laughs> me watching your video. <laughs> just like having a parasocial relationship. relationship like, like with someone she you was telling me. With. Yeah. Yes, she was telling me <laughs> and <videos> for me. <clears throat> other people um, <laughs> about the economy. And it's like a huge, like, multi million view video. But, like, I think that's, like, that's what you do really well, like, with your 
biggest news of the week series. I mean, that popped off for a reason, translating news to Gen Z. Yeah, I feel like a big part of why my content works mm -hmm. is because people can understand economics, mm -hmm. uh, but for some reason it's not taught in K through 12 when yeah. it could be. It totally could be. Um, That's what I've learned from you. Yeah. So I'm like, why is this only like, college or like AP class or IB class material. If everyone knew how things ran, they would be really pissed off. Yeah, they and want the, to change it all. The people who control the education curriculums are the same politicians that benefit from the economy being set up for why it is, so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. But teaching people about it, they want to know about it. They're curious yeah. because they live as participants in the economy. So don't they have a right to understand To know it? what the hell's going on? Yeah. When I always see people like, you know, I feel like this is a common trope online of people being like, uh, why don't they teach us about taxes in school? Right. Like that's just like one example of people mm -hmm. yearning for the, the children, yeah. yearning for the minds, but of people yearning for economic information where they're like, I don't fucking know how to do that. I'm tired of calling my dad every time I need to file my taxes, mm -hmm. telling him how much money I made and stuff, you know, and if you don't have a pair of tooths, like, literate with that kind of thing, yeah. then what? You gotta same pay some random news. company. The news is the same. Mm -hmm. Like, they intentionally don't want us to think critically about what's happening. Like, what happened yesterday? What's likely to happen tomorrow? Why is what's happening today happening today? Mm -hmm. And, like, the biggest propaganda is they choose what stories to cover. I was going to... So, I was going to ask you about that specifically, because, like, this is a space you navigate in. I saw a video of somebody talking about how, like, the news is heavily incentivized to just talk about, like, the most clickbaity stuff, mm -hmm. whether or not it's actually the most important stuff. Yeah. And I feel like you do a good job of focusing on the most important things that are happening, even if they're not clickbaity, mm -hmm. and still getting millions of people to listen to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. What do you think with, like, mainstream media? Like, do you think that has, like, a massive effect, or, or do you think they're... No. Yeah, I mean, it's so weird because mainstream media is picking those topics because they want people to keep watching, so if they watch the commercials and they get the money from the advertisers, and it's like, I think people are so sick of it, mm -hmm. and I think they're sick of, like literally the richest people in the world owning media companies mm -hmm. um like bezos owning the wall street journal what's up with that william yeah. randolph first like it's oftentimes like these super capitalist enterprises are so in bed with media that they have their own incentives for not covering certain stories uh and they see it as a business more mm -hmm. than something important like for society. Like a flow of information. Yeah, yeah like, that, like a people have a right, right to know about the world. Yeah, yeah, and that like you have a responsibility in conveying information to convey good and honest information. Mm -hmm. And I feel like people are leaning more towards like individual independent news mm -hmm. because they trust that more than they trust a corporation that has its own agenda. Yeah, there's a, there's a really deep mistrust of news, especially mainstream media. Do you think that like I feel like, and maybe I, I might not even be right on this, but I feel like a lot of the mistrust of, like, mainstream news started out with, like, Fox News being like, don't trust the other news stations, only mm -hmm. listen to us. But now it's kind of, like, backfired on everyone, where no one mm -hmm. trusts any news stations at all, especially Fox News. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And, like, even, like, the special counsel that ended up deposing Biden on October 8th, so he's dealing with... Mm -hmm the fallout of the October 7th attack mm -hmm. and uh, was probably up all night and he gives this deposition where special counsel left and they're like, oh, like Biden is losing his mind. Mm -hmm. He couldn't even remember when his son Bo died. Now it just came out that special counsel never asked him directly to recount when his son Bo died. He was like, oh yeah, and then, uh, you know, he was talking about his son's death and things that happened and he's like, oh, and what month was it? Oh yeah, May 30th he died. Oh and my so God. that's something so I misleading. Would do. Right. Yeah, it's so such a to, misleading headline. Like I think he's old and I think he's He does have legitimate to be moments. Present. Yeah. He has legitimate moments where he's like lapsing. But like obviously that's not one of them and so it's just contributing to a greater narrative of him being like senile, which like Yeah. For me when I see thing examples like that, I'm like, what's the point when you can find other examples of him actually like forgetting what he's talking about? And so we're in a new space where even primary sources are giving us fake news yeah um 
and that's scary especially because like i reported on this after it happened and now there needs to be subsequent reporting of like actually this isn't what happened but the impact of the initial story is already there it's already there it won't go a lot of people aren't going to watch the update you know right and so i think that's why it's really cool to have a bought in audience that cares about stories being yeah. followed up on and like having the responsibility to follow up even when it's yeah. not sexy yeah even when it's especially when it's not sexy do you think that there's like do you think that's the solution is there a solution to this because this is becoming like an information-based epidemic really yeah i think it is the solution to have like just regular people with integrity doing their own thing yeah who do it for the love of doing it because you know i don't have anyone saying like mm-hmm. oh run this story we'll pay you and yeah. if they did i'd be like f off like if i wanted to sell out i could have yeah well and you've already faced pretty significant professional backlash for having unpopular opinions which yeah. now I have become mainstream opinions yeah that's very true yeah so that's very very true you're like first to a lot of narratives that people are hostile to and then with greater mm-hmm. understanding they'll be like actually there were valid points were made maybe i should have chilled out a little bit yeah i think there's a there's been a weird misconception that like you have to adjust what you're saying so that it's palatable to the masses mm-hmm. i've never really liked that yeah. uh i've always liked people who are really honest even when it it's un- unpopular. unpopular yeah i think at the time i might piss people off but in the long run i think more people have trusted me and like i've definitely worked in organizations like news orgs where they avoid saying mm-hmm. things that are unpopular yeah there's like certain buzzwords like all the news stations that were jumping like through hoops to avoid saying the word genocide for example right absolutely yeah yeah uh that's they been a knew, huge thing they were like it's going to trigger the audience into having a certain reaction but like if that's if that's what it is Mm -hmm. what else is there to call it right yeah the definition fits why are we jumping through hoops because it's an ally of the united states because israel is and i think a a big thing people are afraid of is like maybe they don't have a strong grasp on world war ii history Mm -hmm. and maybe they don't have a strong grasp on the history of what's happened on that land and that's why they're afraid to say certain things maybe they don't know about the nakba right exactly and i think that's where your job as a journalist is to also kind of be a historian Mm -hmm. like you can't really report on what's happening right now without thinking about what happened in the past and so context yeah like i never went to journalism school but I studied history and was a TA for history at the graduate level Mm -hmm. and that I think suits me better to be a journalist than if I went to school specifically learning how to write stories in a way that people are hooked you know I would say so because like all current events are informed by you know the history that came before them Mm -hmm. especially like when it comes to like regions that are often misunderstood or have like a lot of propaganda around them if you're not like fluent in how to decipher propaganda how to identify propaganda that's something a lot of people don't learn in school is propaganda mm-hmm. identification you know mm-hmm. and that's luckily i went to like a private school that focused on that for like a whole semester yeah and i think as an adult that's really prevented me from falling down like you know disingenuous pot, pot line, uh, mm-hmm. pipelines <laughs> not plot lines pipelines of misinformation and stuff because there's certain red flags like regardless of what the political opinion is regardless what side it is or whatever Mm -hmm. there's red flags that come up no matter what that are just signs that scream like this is propaganda regardless of where it's coming from Mm -hmm. yeah i think it's it's weird because you get called a conspiracy theorist for saying things that are based on a pattern of behavior Mm -hmm. and one of the biggest problems i run into is we're not taught our own history Mm -hmm like CIA history Mm -hmm. and all of the covert operations of the United States. Mm -hmm. Of course, we don't like saying we're the bad guys, but there's so much evidence of like- We've been the bad guys. Us being the bad guys. Plenty of times. And I think people being reluctant to be critical of the United States is a source of a lot of people like taking to propaganda. Mm -hmm. Um, It's easier. It's easier to not like, people take shame very personally. Yeah. And, like, neurodivergent people especially get pretty comfortable with shame compared to, like, neurotypical people. So shame's not something that you're, like, acclimated to. Like, if you weren't bullied and stuff. Right. It can be a lot harder of a pill to swallow. Whereas, Mm -hmm. like, shame is 
oftentimes like a healthy natural reaction to something that is happening mm -hmm. like my best friend's son accidentally like hit her in the eye when he was playing he like yeah. went like this and he got her in the eye and he started crying and stuff and she was like hey you know like it's fine but we have to just be careful we have to be aware of like what's around us mm -hmm. and he's like five and he was like i don't want to look in the mirror and then we were both like wow. what did someone tell him not to look in the mirror when he cries or something like what happened does he have a crazy teacher but it was just like his five-year-old way of saying that like he was embarrassed he was yeah. feeling shame he didn't want to like he didn't mm -hmm. like himself at that moment and she was explaining to him like you know what if you do something bad and you recognize that it's bad it's like totally normal to feel a little bit of shame about that but that doesn't mean you're never going to be able to look in the mirror again it just means that like you're a good person because you feel bad for doing a bad thing mm -hmm. and i think that like a lot of people maybe when they were five they didn't have their parents explain that to them that like if you're somebody with a strong moral compass and you like believe in our country you know you want us to be great mm -hmm. and then you see like the things that we've done we're never going to be great if you look at bad things that we've done and you stand by them mm. that's just it's just not how you improve that's not actually like caring i think a lot of people mistake like blind allegiance for caring it's not true like mm. we're like best friends if you did something that i didn't agree with i'd be like jess i think that you're better than that mm -hmm. and you would probably tell me the same thing you'd be like you you're better than that and like mm -hmm. that's how we improve that's how you like hold people and things you care about accountable so they can be mm -hmm. as good as they can be right and when you like lie about history and you don't paint the whole picture like our military has like participated in so much psychological warfare that's like a series i've been doing recently mm -hmm. and like a lot of times like americans when they hear that they're like very defensive they're right. like well other countries are doing that too right sure but like well, i'm not talking about that right now i'm talking mm -hmm. about like every time i say something people are like well what about japan during world war ii Right. Like, yeah, it was a terrible imperialist nation during World War II, but I have videos on that, and then this is a video about us mm -hmm. doing something. So, like, that comment section is for that, this comment section is for this. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see, like, how quickly, like, people recoil right. w when it comes to, like, us doing bad things, which we routinely do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the scale of American empire is something that, like, most people don't even know about. Mm -hmm. And, like, we're taught in detail about these other countries being the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think the American exceptionalism we have and like making excuses for ourselves brings us further away from the United States actually becoming a, a really good country. Absolutely. It's that classic thing of like, it's very patriotic to be critical of the United States. It is. And like, I, <laughs> I was talking about this with someone a while ago where like, I was complaining about things that we've done as a country and they were like, well, then where would you want to live? Mm -hmm. And I was like, here, I would want to live here. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know how to break this to you, but, like, I'd be critical of anywhere that I live. Mm -hmm. Like, the place I'm going to criticize first is wherever I happen to be born. Like, yeah. wherever I live. Right. Because that's of the most, uh, like, highest importance to me. Because that's mm -hmm. where I am. Yeah. You it's, know? It's like we put roses in our house. They come with thorns. But we cut them off we and we them put off. them in a vase and it's chill. And it's fine. They're Do beautiful. Do they poke us? Can they hurt us? Yeah, they could before we took the thorns off. It's like yeah. this idea that, that change isn't possible, I think maybe reveals that people understand this behind the scenes. Like all mm -hmm. the conspiracy theories we see about the world now, very concerning that people are aware. They're like, something's off. And there's very extreme explanations for what it is. Yeah. When like almost every time the most basic example is like, yeah, some really rich guy is making money off of making this thing yeah. bad. He's being it's a piece like, of shit. Yeah, and it, uh, like greed and the concentration of wealth explains a lot of our society's mm -hmm. problems. And I think that's uncomfortable for people because we're taught that we live in a meritocracy and the reason people have so much money is because they're smart and they worked hard. Yeah, and they're good. And realizing they're that the that's not the case is like the hardest thing to get people to realize because I think a lot of people want to believe that's true. Yeah, because they want that to be them. And they, there's also a, a sense of like, if I became a billionaire, I wouldn't want people sitting around talking about how it's not ethical. I'd want people to be proud of me because I fucking worked for that. And it's like, mm -hmm. sure, like even people who truly like are not from wealth, like there's billionaires who were born into homelessness and, mm -hmm. and now they're billionaires. There's actual rags to riches stories, but that's not what people are talking about. They're not mm -hmm. saying that that person sat down and like enslaved people directly. They're saying that that person hired a factory that hired a factory that hired a factory that uses slave labor. Mm -hmm. because it's the supply chain somewhere in there someone is being taken advantage of 
and maybe one day we could get to a point of extreme wealth where there's no one being taken advantage of but also the wealth would never be as extreme in that situation mm-hmm. like sure maybe someone has a trillion dollars in that distant utopia you like future but then maybe having a trillion dollars is the standard <laughs> at that point so it doesn't matter you know yeah. maybe everyone has a trillion dollars and so therefore it doesn't mean anything mm-hmm. and like that should be the goal it, it, we shouldn't have like a financial hierarchy as like a built-in goal the goal should just be that like money becomes irrelevant because everyone has whatever they need mm-hmm. and then does whatever they want and people are gonna be like you're a communist <laughs> but yeah. wouldn't it be awesome though like if we didn't have to worry about this made-up thing that we created it'd be right. great that like people are totally just i don't think they're chill with it but i think that it's just not taught that like you look back at the Cargill dynasty, one of the biggest, you know, food oligopolies in the country. They bought a, like, the initial telegram, not telegram, where they send it through the wires. Oh, 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 the, t- the telegraph. The phone, telegraph. Yeah. And uh, so they had one of the first ever, if not the first ever, and they would be able to s- assess the crops in the Midwest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they initially didn't start as a manufacturer of food, but they would ship grain and they had this telegraph and, or telegram, and they would send messages back to Wall Street when they saw a crop failing. They'd be like, mm. oh, invest in this company, divest from that company. And they quickly acquired so much wealth just because they had this exclusive access to information. Mm-hmm. And it's like, is that fair? Does that mean mm-hmm. they get to control all of the food manufacturing in the Mm. United States today. Do we feel good about one family making decisions about, you know, over 40% of our food supply? Mm -hmm. Because I don't. I don't either. And what's interesting is, like, people treat access to that kind of technology the same way that they treat, like, athletes who are incredibly talented. And it's, like, a false equivalency completely. Right. Like, if if LeBron James is the best basketball player ever and, like, 90% of his shots are from like three yards back to the right or whatever Mm -hmm. and then people made it illegal to shoot from that spot you know he would still be the best he would just shoot from somewhere Mm -hmm. else and so people treat like having a resource that other people don't have they treat it as if it's something like that that's like inherent Mm -hmm. when it's not like he was born like that that's not a that's not Mm -hmm. equivalent to somebody getting technology that like isn't a part of them that they just acquired it's not the same thing and people treat it like it's the same mm-hmm. whereas like you having a telegram is not inherent mm-hmm. with your birth this is, this is not something you just happen to have mm-hmm. and people treat like money as if it's just like a natural resource that like some people are born with some people aren't and some people are born with it but it's not it's not like inherent in your dna it's just like happenstance and so therefore it's not like the same but i always see that analogy and it drives mm-hmm. me crazy because it's not it's not equivalent at all right of course it's like lebron james should be allowed to compete in the nba and sure he's great he's a great natural athlete and he's put the work in he's put the work in he but shouldn't be punished about for being the best basketball and the nba as a league is the rules aren't defined what yeah. supplements you can and can't take, what the rules of the basketball game are. Of course, people are going to make criticisms like, oh, well, LeBron's good with the refs. Okay, to some degree, that's true. But to a very extreme, the yeah. rules are not defined in our economy. And in fact, the people who create the rules are also benefiting from the rules being bent in a certain direction. We have members of Congress invested in stock and companies they regulate. Mm-hmm. And we don't pay them a salary that's higher than the dividends they get from a lot of these companies Mm -hmm. and from lobbyists. So guess what? They work for them now. They're writing the rules and they're the player. What if LeBron was the ref, the best player, and also ran the league? Like, that's the economic system in the United States. Exactly. That's an actual equivalent scenario. It's not the same. He's operating within the rules. He just happens to be the best. And I don't think people would have the level of animosity that they do have towards, like, the ultra-wealthy if the same people were like, I don't want to watch basketball anymore, actually. Yeah, like, this yeah. is fucked. Screw this guy, you know? Yeah. Like, if, if we had, like, very clear-cut rules and it was, like, a super fair system and it really did just come down to, like, who cares the most? Mm-hmm. And whoever cares the most makes the most money. I don't think people would be upset with that mm-hmm. because they'd be like, all right, you know what? You follow the rules. No one's suffering because you happen to give more of a fuck, mm-hmm. you know, but like, that's not what's happening at all. In fact, it's a lot of people who don't care enough 
who are making a fuck ton of money at the expense of people who really, really care. Like, the hardest working people in America are probably, like, single moms without a job. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, they're putting in the most labor. They're getting nothing. They're not Mm -hmm. getting paid. In fact, it's, like, a huge net negative. Mm -hmm. You know? And meanwhile, like, somebody who can essentially, like, hand off 99.9% of their daily tasks to, like, a team is making the most money Mm -hmm. and because like why because like maybe they happen to just be a legacy in their parents company or like they got into the best schools because they're circling back part of the legacy program which i think is like kind of an insane idea to have like like Mm -hmm. it'd be it'd be cute right like i get the idea behind it like it's cute if your kids can go to the same school you went to that's Mm -hmm. cute but when like the education system in america when it can give you such like a crazy leg up and like your kids are not operating at that level like they shouldn't still be favored above people who are operating at that level you know what i'm saying right being a ta to a professor at brown i would get all of the papers in for like we had like 100 kids in that class Mm -hmm. and it was very obvious who was a legacy admin and who was not not just because their last names are very recognizable and because you know who they are but because the quality of their work is so much less yeah and it's sad and it's not true for all of them but it's it's true for a lot of them and it's really disheartening to see the result of some people working 10 times as hard to get to the same place someone else is at and it's really about like if we really believed in meritocracy we would think like the quality of your skills and the work you put in determines your success Mm -hmm. and to see people get handed things and be successful and the path dependency of that wealth like looking at wealth disparity in mississippi and the divisions across race it's like the same people that made a ton of money off of chattel slavery off of free labor have reinvested that and grown that wealth and we're never going to set that right unless we assess wealth distribution. And a lot of people don't want to have that conversation. It's very uncomfortable. And I remember talking to someone who was a libertarian. It was this like socialism versus capitalism debate we Mm -hmm. had at Brown. And this guy was like, I just don't think anyone should get anything for free. And that's what socialism is. And it's like, no, it's, it's really just saying the economy should be set up in a way that the people who work to create the things with their own two hands get a fair share of the work they put in all of the money made off of the stuff they make and sell doesn't belong to the person who paid for their wage. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he's like, no one should get anything for free. And after he gave his little speech, I was like, I just have a question because you said no one should get anything for free. So what's your position on wealth inheritance? Mm -hmm. He was like, oh, I I think it's fine. I think parents should be able to pass down their wealth. But you're getting it for free. And everyone laughed. And so I didn't need to say more than that because people kind of get that. And the point was proven. Yeah. Sorry, that was my mom. Keep going. The yeah. point's proven, though, like, it's, so it's, like, <laughs> I think that's just, like, so cartoonish that, like, he doesn't see how, like, right. that's a glaring contradiction. Yeah, and we should be able to, like, set our kids up for success and do the best we can, but they shouldn't be allowed to just inherit all of the money and make a bunch of more money off of that money. Like, the rate of return on capital is much greater than the return on labor. So you can work really hard your entire life and still not be much mm-hmm. better than your parents, but if you start off with a chunk of money... You can give that to investors. They invest it into a company. They turn the company into something bigger. Mm-hmm. And it's just because they're exploiting labor. Mm-hmm. Like, they're paying someone less than their labor's mm-hmm. worth. And this has accelerated a lot. Like, companies just raising prices. During the COVID-19 pandemic, if you look at the numbers, before 2020, from, we have data 1979 to 2019, where you see where price increases the money made by the company like where it went 7.9 percent was profit Mm -hmm. and it was around 60 percent over 50 percent that was going to workers so Mm -hmm. they're paying higher wages after the COVID-19 pandemic when we were experiencing like inflation because of supply chain issues you actually look at the pricing breakdown and it shows over 61 percent is profit Mm -hmm. So this idea that they're incurring all of these additional costs because inflation, everything's just more expensive, it right. doesn't show up in non-labor it's input not, costs. Yeah, it's not parallel. Or labor input costs. Like, yeah. it's all profit. They're raising prices because they can, and the data shows it. It's like, you can't really squeeze working people from both ends, mm-hmm. not increasing wages and increasing prices, so we can hardly afford to live. 
this isn't an economic system that has longevity and now rich people are scared mm -hmm. they're like well people are going to get really mad and it's like well they you know are. exactly why yeah you know exactly why because we're looking very french revolutionary yeah right now mm -hmm. and like it we we really truly are we're actually getting to a point of wealth disparity where i think it's actually technically ratio was worse yeah than directly before the french revolution which is fucking insane actually mm -hmm. um and for those of you who aren't familiar with the french revolution that's when like king louis and marie antoinette got decapitated for being greedy so like i see why rich people are worried about it but like at the same time you know like obviously not every rich person has like the influence to to you know change the system but like if they were truly worried about it i feel like they could get together mm -hmm. and like do something about it but they're they're not they're like superficially worried like uh oh better up my security kind of worry you know instead of uh oh better fix the system kind of worry you know mm -hmm. and like I, I hope we don't get to a breaking point where people end up, you know, decapitating people, you know, that, mm -hmm. that's pretty severe, but also, like, if people are starving to death at they outrageous rates, at that point. you know, that's what's gonna happen, yeah. And it's scary. Like, when I gave my TED Talk, I had this slide at the end mm -hmm. that was just like, here's every other country that had a terrible civil war because wealth inequality got mm -hmm. extreme. It's not a coincidence that there was extreme wealth inequality right before things came to a head. Yeah, it always happens. And I think there's a belief that some people have of just like, you have to go to another podcast. Yeah, but it's in 15 minutes, so okay. it'll just like warm me because I'm gonna film it in here. So I'm gonna set up this timer for like 13 minutes and then I'll just jump on there. Yeah, I think some people just believe they're genuinely better than working people. And that working they do people's believe that. only purpose is to drone on and make their lives comfortable and make the things that they want to eat. And that they're just dumb and worse than you. Yeah. So your wealth is deserved and your position in society is deserved. You're allowed to make, you know, passive income off of other people's labor. Mm -hmm. Well, they suffer because fundamentally they believe they're better than working no, people. No, they do. There's, a, there's like a, a financial caste system that I think is reinforced very heavily amongst super wealthy families i mean if you've ever met anyone who went to like la rose for example they're like the worst people you've ever fucking met in your life like i i've met like several mm -hmm. the only person and for anyone who doesn't know it's the most expensive boarding school in the world don't i've only met one person who went there who mm -hmm. was normal yeah so they're obviously the exception to the general rule because the vast majority of people who i met were just fucking terrible mm -hmm. never tipped rude to waiters mm -hmm. would go to open houses jump all over the beds who the fuck does that like i literally saw that happen <laughs> i literally saw that happen and so it's like it is just like this whole idea that like you're inherently better mm -hmm. just because like you're born into wealth yeah. which like at at like let's let's pretend that delusional idea has some merit which like it doesn't um at the very most like your parents are are better than working class people if you're gonna mm -hmm. go with that narrative you haven't actually done anything mm -hmm. so like you are not better at all like mm -hmm. let's pretend your parents are like really inspirational pulled themselves up from the bootstraps did the whole thing that you're like supposed to do even though people do that every day and it doesn't get them fucking anywhere mm -hmm. at, at the most like your parents are are better your parents are like the success story your parents have achieved the american dream you haven't done anything you just happen to be here you yeah know? and I, yet they instill this like mentality through the generations because like by dehumanizing people who are lower on this financial caste system it makes them feel less bad when they treat people like shit mm -hmm. you know because if you teach empathy to kids who have like trillions of dollars you know like they're going to be inclined to give a lot of that away mm-hmm Maybe after three generations, your family's upper middle class. Right. Because yeah. everyone was so empathetic, they started trying to fix the problems. And that's that's not how you become a Rockefeller. Right. Uh, the big misconception is, like, money and value are the same. Like, where money flows, mm -hmm. it's flowing to the places that, you know, members of society value the mm -hmm. most. And that the price of something determines its value or like how much money someone's made over their lifetime is how much value they've contributed right and like decoupling those two ideas and really realizing that they couldn't be more disconnected they have that i value the work of you know a nurse in the emergency room far more than i value the work of an investor on wall street 
But yeah. the amount of money that they're paid is very different from what they contribute to society. And I think really marinating on that and thinking, okay, how do we change our economic structures? Mm -hmm. So that it's a little bit more representative of what people feel. Like and how what much they people's value actual people. values are. Like, yeah. for example, like, I don't know, like teachers, mm -hmm. childcare, mm -hmm. things that keep people alive. Right. You know, like those are all things like people who make food. Mm -hmm. That's like a big problem America has specifically is like the yeah. lack of food regulations. It's it's insane compared to literally anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And it's because, you know, people are people just make more money off of people getting sick and feeling mm -hmm. like shit yeah. all the time and pro selling them like half plastic food because mm -hmm. it's like cheaper and it's full of fillers and processed <laughs> shit. Profit margins on yeah. sludge are yeah. higher than profit margins on microgreens, you know? Literally. And yeah. then ideally you get really fucking sick from eating like shit for your entire life, which is mm -hmm. why we're seeing a huge rise in colon cancer because of all these preservatives and plastics and microplastics and food and shit. And then like they can treat the fuck out of that forever too. Mm -hmm. Which like I know there's like a big conspiracy that like cancer was cured forever ago and they just haven't released it. I don't think that's true. But mm -hmm. like I understand why people have that conspiracy though, because it's like that's something that seems entirely possible given the way everything else functions in our country, unfortunately. And with conspiracy theories, I think actually it speaks to a high level of creativity and a low level of resource. I think that's where, like, most conspiracy theories in, like, middle America are born from because there's, like, this intellectually elite concept that, like, if you don't live in California or New York, you're a fucking idiot <laughs> by comparison. These are cultural epicenters, blah, blah, blah. which, like, sure, they're cultural epicenters because there's, like, high volumes of people there, mm. but everybody else, like, medium intellect in New York is the same as medium intellect in, like, Nevada or like Mississippi or anywhere else you just might have more resources because everything is so compact and built up mm -hmm. so I think when you have somebody in like a rural area who's creative and they see like this is a problem but they don't yeah. have the resources to get answers on like why it's a problem or like potential solutions mm -hmm. then they end up trying to like piece these ideas together mm -hmm. get from point A to point B and then that's how like a conspiracy theory is born because mm -hmm. it's like a creative attempt at like making things make sense, mm -hmm. you know? And there's huge skepticism around like people who are educated that like if you go to an elite university or one of the, the big schools that you're becoming dumber and they're indoctrinating you. Yeah, and there's skepticism <laughs> around education. And it's like, okay, got it. Where did you learn this conspiracy theory? And it's like, oh, I read it in a book. What do you think I was doing in the university? I was reading yeah. books on books every day. Yeah, so what's the difference? But you don't trust my books over your books, your book that was intentionally made to shape your political mind and yeah. implant this seed in your head about politics. Like, you're not skeptical of that. Mm -hmm. It's really a lack of critical thinking. It's scary, but people were controlled for so long because media was limited, and I think now people are getting smarter but don't have a lot of direction about where to get good information and how to assess what is good information. Yeah. But it is a great equalizer because a lot of what we're talking about, about like the food industry being mm -hmm. corrupt and like the oligopolies in the country and mm -hmm. wealth concentration. We know this because we have the Internet now. Absolutely. And now they're very scared that we have the Internet. There's all of these bills on the floor of Congress for banning TikTok, mm -hmm. uh, the Kids Online Safety Act, which will ban access to a lot of news information for young people. And that's really scary. Yeah, it is. And with like <laughs> with the fucking Internet, I mean. There is definitely a problem with, like, reading comprehension mm -hmm. online, for sure, which, like, I think that's just, like, a natural awkward phase for people suddenly having such a small world at their mm -hmm. fingertips, so you have access to anyone and everyone, but I, I am waiting for that pendulum to swing, because, like, I know it will, but I'm waiting for it, because, like, oftentimes when you see somebody, like, post something online, like, if I make an information video, and I say something like, Elephants can sometimes be... Elephants are actually black because, you know, they're just dusty, so they look gray. Mm. And then you'll see somebody in the comments that are like, but what you're saying is that they're still gray, though, because they have dust on them. And you're like, yeah, th but they're not literally gray. They, they appear to be gray, but, mm. like, they're actually black. And they'll be like, but if they appear to be gray, they're gray. 
and you just end up in this like these dumb ass conversations <laughs> online all the, it happens all the time and it's just it's a matter of like reading comprehension not being like taught well in in schools and we mm -hmm. have like a reading epidemic in schools as well because like in school they would teach you like yes like we're not being so literal you know like we're being non-literal it's a gray area it's a gray so ah, elephant boom, there's a lack of nuance they're too the black and white problems. about it yeah exactly <laughs> exactly no there is a lack of 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 nuance online but i do think again like i think it's just like an awkward phase of the internet mm -hmm. you know that'll like eventually sort itself out plus there's so many young people online mm -hmm. and like most of us are dumb when we're when we're younger just by an adult standard yeah not by your age standard you're fine for 12 you know mm -hmm. like whatever yeah totally i think like media that educates is so where it's at like our buddy john green Love your john. work like i think using a platform on social media not just to like be like hey let me tell you about this thing that's on my mind or mm -hmm. this thing that's important but also like let's give some information so i have a good question to, to okay good get us back on i think okay we're both in the shot yes all right so like ideally jessica what is where this is a, a big question that you might change your opinion on later which is fine because it's not controversial but yeah, we live and grow and change yes <laughs> we, we live and grow and change but what do you what do you think your ideal career trajectory is that's such a good question i don't know i think like ideally there's people who don't consume now consume news now there's working class people who like don't trust the news mm -hmm. And I think, like, I want them to watch my videos and not necessarily, like, get all of their news from me. Mm -hmm. But I think learn how to weed out, like, what is propaganda and what is real. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, use my content in that way. Because I used to get all these comments, like, I just want, like, your brain. Like, I want your frame of analysis for how you view the world. And I was like, well, I should give that to people. Yeah. Like, I should tell people what I know. Yeah. And so I think, like, ideally people watch the news to get some of, you know, my analysis from my news stuff. Um, but I don't think I want to be in the everyday news cycle. Right. And I think, like, giving weekly-ish news commentary is really fun. And, like, giving my perspective on the world has been really fun and, like, rewarding. And, like, I want to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. And... I never want to run for office. Everyone's like, well, obviously you talk about politics, you're going to run for office. And it's like, no, I think I just want people to rock out with me and like get my perspective yeah. on stuff. Actually, knowing you in real life, you don't at all seem like someone who would run for office. Like, I get no. why people say that online when they have just like a parasocial relationship with you and they only see you in that context. But mm -hmm. like, you just don't have the personality archetype to run no. for office. I think you would be successful if you ran for office, but that's like a totally different question is whether or not you would succeed. It's mm -hmm. just you don't have that sort of like delusional like ego to to want to be in charge of what other people do. Yeah, I don't want power. Yeah. I don't care to have it. Yeah. I care about people living a good life and like I care about influencing society in a way where like people realize the necessary things to liberate ourselves <laughs> as a people, right? Like, oh, like, yeah, it is corrupt in that way and we should all probably do something about mm -hmm. it. You know, I want to help people realize some of the stuff I realize about why the world's corrupt and like how people have been oppressed. And like that a better world's possible, mm -hmm. but I don't need to be the one in the position of power. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the difference between like holding office and being an influential like speaker is like when you hold office, people have to follow your ideas. Mm -hmm. Your ideas are like implemented. Whereas like when you're telling people your ideas and you're just like speaking on something, they can like take whatever parts of that or none yeah. of it if they don't want to. Mm -hmm. So there's no, like, you're not, like, asserting, like, dominance over anybody the way that, like, you do when you're in office. And, like, that's why I say that it doesn't, like, suit your personality because that's, that's just not something that you, like, are interested in doing. Like, yeah. you're not really interested in telling people, like, how to live their lives. You're interested in telling people how you wish people lived their lives, which is different. Yeah. Like, I would like our government to be a reflection of what the majority of people want. Yeah anyone can do that yeah um and some people like being leaders some people like running for office and being in that role and like that's great mm -hmm. 
hopefully they do it responsibly. But I don't feel like it has to be me. I feel like I'm a jester in this scenario, yes. right? Like, I'm one of the people that's like, hey, look, this is what I, I see in the world. Mm -hmm. And, like, isn't this ridiculous? Isn't this silly? As you're saying, you want to be, like, more of, like, a gesture. Je <laughs> gesture. I want to be, be a gesture. You want to be more of a jester Jess pointing out, like, gesture. how ridiculous. Yeah, Jess yeah. is short for jester. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't want to be in the position of, you know, the king, right? Yeah. Like, I, I don't want to be the person responsible for governing. Yeah. I don't know, it seems boring. It like, does seem boring, actually. It's like, here's your budget, and you have to do these things, and execute stuff. I'm really bad at administrative tasks. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be writing policy and in meetings, doing mm -hmm. legislation all day. I thought that was going to fall. There's a ghost. There's um, a ghost. I want to... The ghost of... American history yeah. heard you say that and it it's sad it almost said Jessica we need you jumped off the ledge um yeah I, I think I'm one of those people that's like hey like look at how messed up stuff is let me make some jokes mm -hmm. about it that feels more like what I'm on the world to do mm -hmm. I agree like you know me as a person mm -hmm. I don't think I would be good at being a public figure in that way you have a lot of strengths, and I, I think you would you would be a good public figure, but do I think you would enjoy it? Yeah. No. I don't, right. I don't think you would enjoy it, because I think you would understandably hold the legitimate weight that comes with that, which I mm -hmm. feel like a lot of people don't. Yeah. Um, or if they if they do, they, they're just, like, being irresponsible with it, and I, I don't think you would be irresponsible with it. Like, mm -hmm. I think you would be a good leader. It's just, like, in order to get to that position, you'd have to run. You would have to want to run. Yeah, and you you just you just don't want to run. Like I don't see you ever wanting to run, really. No. If people could just like force you to be in a political role, I think you would kill it. But like that's just not how shit works. Right. You know. Yeah. So I just don't see it happening because you would have to want to do it. And then speaking of, so like you worked on Bernie's campaign. Mm. You can tell me if you don't want to talk about this or not. No, we can talk about it. But anything. you worked on Bernie's campaign, and then a lot of people who were previously working on his campaign came out this year because they were upset with him. Mm. And you were also upset with him because yes, of his, yeah. his stance on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Yeah, we all signed a letter. Yeah. He initially, and, you know, we were protesting at his office. Um, it's weird because you have this guy who's always so good on the issue. And then after October 7th, it was almost like everyone's eyes were on this issue that a lot of people in, like, lefty and organizing spaces cared about for a long time. And a lot of people with Palestinian friends cared about this for a long time but it just was again one of those far away conflicts that americans are, are told doesn't really affect us even though american public dollars pay for universal health care in israel and have mm -hmm. given them a military for a very long time and have helped establish israel as a state and bernie was always very critical of netanyahu's right-wing government i mean this is someone who came in there and really brought the whole situation backwards you have Jimmy Carter and a lot of world leaders saying Netanyahu is not someone who wants there to ever be a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. He wants it to be Israel from the river. Yeah, Jimmy he, Carter especially, he, he, has, he has a lot of really good opinions on that conflict. Right, and now you have this guy like moving towards that in the United States and very left figures in government in the United States saying, you know, we support Israel. And I can see someone saying like, you know, we support the Jewish citizens living there, we support the people there, but to say you support Netanyahu's right-wing government and protecting an ethno-state mm -hmm. is just like a crazy thing for someone who's like a leftist politician to say. Yeah. And it almost felt like in this moment, it's like, wow, like we really lost someone who was one of our only allies in government. Mm -hmm. And it was really scary. Yeah. 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 I, I, I know that I, when we were when that was first happening, we talked about it, like, a lot, obviously, like, off-camera, mm -hmm. just, like, in person, because Jessica visits once a month, but, um, True. so, like, it, I think it shocked, like, a lot of people, especially a lot of people in Gen Z, because mm -hmm. he's always had such a strong, like, youth base, Yeah, and he's also always been, like, so comfortable with being on, like, the controversial side of an issue, like, being early to things before it becomes mainstream mm -hmm. obvious. Oh, of course that's not okay, or of course we should do this, or of course we should do that. And then this is a situation where he is, like, in alignment with, like, most other people in the, the government mm -hmm. on something that's, like, in my opinion, very regressive. Mm -hmm. And so it, like, what, what do you think contributed to that? Do you, like, have any opinions on that? 
I don't know. There's like so many theories about like what's going on with Bernie. And I think he has been put in a position where he has a lot of power mm -hmm. as a chairman of the Senate Budget Committee. And I think he's seen his role as like very narrow like this is where i can affect change and maybe he doesn't want to ruffle feathers on other fronts and get censured like rashida talib was willing to do um because he's like you know what this is the one thing i can do and so i'm not going to risk my position within the democratic party because i have so much influence in this position that's positive mm -hmm. and it's almost like a cutting your losses type of mentality when i think what a lot of people in the United States wanted when they elected the Rashida Tlaibs and the Ilhan Omars and the Jamal Bowman and Cory Bush and AOC was you need to get in there and just say what's happening. Be mm -hmm. really frank. Be like, hey, we have so many civilians being killed with weapons paid for by American dollars. We have laws that Joe Biden has signed that say we cannot give weapons to human rights violators. And that's really what's going on. And like, we should put what happened on October 7th in the timeline of what's been happening in the region for so long. And it's like the fact that he wasn't willing to use his voice and position in Congress to do that. Mm -hmm. And it took so much public pressure to get him and the squad and all of these people that were supposedly progressive that we elected to not even like say anything about apartheid and then genocide. It was just kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, and if any other country had an APAC. Mm -hmm. If any other country had an explicit political action committee meant to influence members of Congress opinions on Israel, that's what they exist for. If that was China, if that was Russia, it's like, oh, we're we're the, the Russia PAC, yeah. the pro-Russia PAC. People would be like, you're domestic terrorists. They would be like, this is interference in our elections. Yeah, they'd be like, you're literally, like, at the very least, like, spies. At the most, you're going to completely derail our democratic system and mm -hmm. just be a literal terror to our yeah. democracy. And the fact that Israel's an exception is crazy. And so to see, like, people fall in line with what the establishment it expects, it's just sad. It's like, mm -hmm. do you are you comfortable now? Is that what it is? Like, you like your life and you don't want to risk it? I was wondering if that's, like, what it was where it's just, like, like maybe he's just getting old. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's just he's just over it, you know? Yeah. Because he is old. He's going to retire soon, but, like, he's still sharp. He's not one of those politicians where it's, like, he's gotten old and then people are, like, is he all the way there? Mm -hmm. So I was just, like, wondering if maybe he just doesn't have that dog in him anymore. Maybe yeah. he's tired because he's been, like, going hard on controversial issues for so long. Mm -hmm. I was like, maybe he's just tired. But then a lot of people were also wondering if it was just, like, he has, like, an inherent bias that he was mm -hmm. unable to look past. And, like, I don't know how to feel about that because he has been outspoken in the past. Right. You know? So mm -hmm. I feel like if, if it was just down to an inherent bi bias because he's Jewish, there's plenty of Jewish people who don't support Israel, you know, right. like you, being Jewish and being Zionist is like a square rectangle situation. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't, I'm not inclined to believe that that's what it is, but I think that that's how it came off to a lot of younger people who weren't familiar with like other things that he had said in the past yeah. about the issue. One of the, the people who worked on the Bernie campaign that I respected like so much, just the way he organized and he has a sub stack now, Oscar Dianjak, he's Jewish. And he wrote a piece about how, like, Jewish teachings mm -hmm. tell us, you know, never again. We can never let something like the Holocaust happen again. Which means never again for anyone. Yeah. So, the persecution of Palestinians and the military occupation of Palestinians and the systematic killing of Palestinians, that's what we vowed to make sure never happened again. And I think there are some people who are Jewish who grew up in Israel and the United States who are taught that What's going on in the region is people hate Israelis and Jewish people in general so much just because of who they are, because they're Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine growing up with that fear that there are some people who, who hate you because of who you are. And that's true. There are mm -hmm. people who hate Jewish people. Yeah, there's the absolutely anti-Semitic people. But that's not true of, of why people don't like Israel. Yeah, they're objecting to the state, not, like, your ethnic background. They've watched their family members' houses be torn down and killed, mm -hmm. you know? Like, it's a colonial enterprise. Mm -hmm. and Well, the fact that they have settlers alone yeah. as a concept. Right. Name, name one situation where there's ever been settlers and it hasn't been inherently problematic. You can't. Right. You literally cannot. 
Yeah, and so you have all these people saying, oh, well, APAC will pay for someone to run against AOC and Rashida Tlaib in the primary, and they'll slander them and spend an insane amount of money on ads and make them look terrible in their district, and that's what they're afraid of so they don't speak out about it. And it's just like, people are being killed every single day. Children are being dug out of rubble. At some point, using your position in public office to speak out against the atrocities is more important than someone running a slanderous ad against you and you Absolutely. losing a primary. Absolutely. Even even if you lose, it's the principle. Mm-hmm. It's the principle of being on the right side of history. And, like, you, like I know you and I both got a lot, a lot of backlash for speaking up against uh, Israel early on before the rest of the Internet sort of caught up once they start, started seeing the footage, started seeing everything that was happening because, like, we've both been very pro-Palestine for years. Mm -hmm. Um, And, like, I know that, like, you got called, like, an anti-Semite on television, you know? Like, I had people in my comments calling me that. And, like, that never bothered me because I know that that's not true. I'm not anti-Semitic at all. Right. I think Judaism is awesome. You know, like, I have no beef. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with that. And, like, it's just being turned into that narrative because it's easier to fight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more defensible. But, like... I feel like this issue has had such, like, a massive ripple effect on, like, the United States political system, finally, because people have been ignoring it for so long, and, like, it's been, it's, obviously, it's it's gotten worse as of late, but it's been a bad situation for decades, for 80 years it's been a bad situation, and so I'm glad people are finally paying attention, but, um, I'm also, like, I feel like I have no idea what's gonna happen in this election cycle because of it. Right. Because, you know? like, a lot of people, rightfully so, they don't want to vote for somebody who's pro genocide. Because, mm-hmm. like, who would want to vote for someone who's pro genocide? You know, and then there's Trump. So then people are sitting there waiting, like, hey, are we going to replace the Democratic candidate? You know, because, like, mm-hmm. people, they just don't like Joe Biden. You know, mm-hmm. they just don't. At least not right now. Statistically, that's. Mm-hmm. I haven't looked at, like, the most recent poll, but, like, a month ago at least, it was, wasn't looking good for Joe. So, like, what do you. What do you think is going to happen versus, like, what do you think should happen? I think what's going to happen is we're going to see a lot of people not excited to show up. Because, again, like, you have two candidates that don't capture the political beliefs of the people who are voting age. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have 40% of people not showing up in even the highest turnout election years. And there's this common narrative of, like, oh, if you criticize Biden and if you don't want to show up to vote for Biden you're supporting Trump. Mm -hmm. And that's just a very weird thing to say. Because if Biden was so great, those 40% of of voters would turn out. And so the people that are showing up and participating in the political process are not guaranteed to go to either party. If Mm -hmm. neither party has proven to keep their campaign promises, which Joe Biden definitely hasn't, um, and they haven't proven to even have a platform in the first place Mm -hmm. that people would want to vote for like you're not guaranteed their votes they don't have to vote for you yeah um and so i think what we're going to see is a bunch of people voting for like third party candidates Mm -hmm. whether it's like an independent green party which Mm -hmm. we've seen in the past uh or Mm write-ins uh i think we're going to see a lot of that we're going to see people that are still showing up to the polls Mm -hmm. and like, protest voting to some extent, because I think many people don't see a third party as being viable yet. Mm -hmm. But I think we're going to see it's the first election where we work towards that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the infrastructure is built for third parties to be viable going forward. But I really don't see, like, the Democratic Party or Republican Party lasting. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I definitely think, like, this is, like, an unpopular opinion. People have been getting so mad at me about this every time I say this. But I really think, like, the two party system is dying. And I think, Absolutely, we're going to see more people voting third party this election cycle than ever before. And like, in, I don't, I'm not saying a third party candidate is going to win this election cycle, but mm-hmm. I do think it'll just be like so significant that mm-hmm. maybe next election cycle they might, you yeah. know, because people are, are really honestly they're they're sick of it, and um, you know, people don't like Republican ideologies a lot of the time because of the social control elements, mm-hmm. but with the Democratic Party, people don't love the Democratic Party right now either because, mm-hmm. like, you know, A, they're not doing a lot of the social good that they, they're they claiming to care about. Right. But, like, I, I gotta give it to the Republicans. I don't like a lot of their policies because, like, I would say I'm technically an independent, but I obviously lean more blue. But, like, I'm only a, an, an independent on the principle, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, 
I gotta give it to the Republicans. They at least know how to win consistently. Like, they, they'll pick a policy and they'll fucking follow through on it, unfortunately, for all of us who disagree with those policies. But, like, the Democratic Party has this problem where, like, people start feeling like they're just running on these policies and they're never, like, cementing these policies so that they can keep running on them. Mm. You know? And so people don't feel like they're progressing. And I think they're getting, like, sick of it. Right, there's yeah. so much promise of like, we're the party of the working class. Like, we fight for working people, we fight for unions, we want better wages, mm -hmm. we want the economy to be one that's, you know, more fair. Mm -hmm. And then you have Bill Clinton sign NAFTA into law. And you see yeah. workers, like, at major plants losing a ton of jobs. Like, the UAW has someone like Sean Fain as their new president who is willing to fight for workers and, like, tear up contracts on national television mm -hmm. when they're not what the workers want. Mm -hmm. And we've also had union presidents who have signed contracts mm -hmm. that the workers don't support and they want to keep striking. And so it's this struggle of, like, a lot of working people see the Democratic Party on the side of, like, a lot of corrupt union presidents just voting for big internationals who, like, don't help the workers and also signing into policies that don't help the workers and, in fact, make life a lot worse for working people. And you even have Jerome Powell as the chairman of the Fed, who was appointed by Donald Trump, whose mm -hmm. explicit policy plan is to make more people unemployed mm -hmm. at a time when prices are so high people can't afford them. And so... When the Democratic Party is saying, like, yes, we want life to be better for working people, but then they take deliberate actions to make life harder, yeah, you're so, going to lose your voting base. Yeah, people are like, what the hell? Like, this isn't yeah. what we care about. And I think that same, like, concept, tr it transfers over, like, multiple, like, multiple points that Democratic politicians run on. Not mm -hmm. even just with, like, the working class. Like, there's multiple areas. I mean, Roe v. Wade getting overturned, that didn't need to happen. No, it didn't. It could have been ratified. Right. But they wanted to keep running on, we have to protect Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. instead of actually protecting Roe v. Wade. And that's what people are getting sick of. But then there's not a good alternative, because then they're, they're like, I'm not going to now go vote red if, I'm, if I care about Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. you know? And so, like, that's, that's why I totally agree, like, third party's going to be bigger than ever. But who do you... What do you think the Democratic Party is going to do? You think they're going to replace Joe Biden? You think they're going to try and push him through and see if he wins? I think what the right thing would be and what's a possible scenario would be, like, because Joe Biden has wanted to be president for forever yeah. and has run time and time again and he's finally got it. I, I don't think he's going to let it go and I think it's more an ego thing than anything mm -hmm. else. And he always says, like, I'm the most qualified person to be president. They all say that. It's like, you're 80 <laughs> years old. Um, no, you're not. Yeah. Because you're not, your I ideas are not representative of the American people anymore, quite frankly. He could have codified Roe in 2021 when the Democrats did have a hairline majority mm -hmm. in the House and the Senate. They could have done it and he didn't and they make excuses like oh well people it, it wouldn't have passed but you didn't try you didn't even try yeah and it was maybe, a campaign promise maybe it would have right yeah you don't know you didn't try it might have yeah exactly and then at least you try you fail we go at least you tried right you didn't even try right and so it's like what do you expect so i think what what could happen is he wins the primaries then it's convention time and then he endorses someone else mm -hmm. and he says everyone i want you know, Kamala or Pete, God forbid, to become the president. And the delegates don't actually have to cast their vote at the convention in the direction mm -hmm. of who their people voted for. It's party business. The delegates go and they can cast their, their delegate vote at the convention for whoever they want. And if Joe Biden endorses someone else, they could, you know, say, all right, Kamala or Kamala mm -hmm. is going to be next. Um, and then a different VP. I, I can see that being a scenario where yeah. he passes the baton that way, but I don't think he's going to drop out mid-primary for sure. Uh, I know. I also am, am seeing it where, like, he ends up passing the baton, but I also, unfortunately, feel like he's going to hold out and, like, try and at least win again and then be like, okay, well, halfway through my second term, I obviously, am, you know, am just too old, mm -hmm. so I'm going to pass it on. Like, that's what I realistically think he wants to do i mean obviously he wants to just be able to make it the whole second term yeah but i feel like that's his contingency plan mm -hmm. and it this is what i mean about like you don't have the the ego for this kind of situation because somebody who actually gave a shit <laughs> about the democratic party winning would pull out mm -hmm. they, they mm -hmm. would pull out they would let a candidate step up who people actually want to win mm -hmm. you know 
Yeah, and like people, like anybody who's voting for Joe Biden right now is is only doing so because they're afraid Trump's going to win. Right. You know, it, it's not because they love Joe Biden. Yeah, exactly. You know? Which is like, obviously Joe Biden's still better than Donald Trump, you know, but mm-hmm. like I also have serious beef with, with the genocide. Like, right. very serious beef that it's, it's hard for me to reconcile with. Mm-hmm. Not serious enough for me to vote for Donald Trump, obviously. Mm-hmm. But, like, it's put a lot of people in a, an uncomfortable position. You know? Yeah. And I've seen what they've done to RFK Jr. And, like, RFK Jr., mm, you know, he's one of those guys who is torn apart by the media because he's willing to talk about the issues in mm-hmm. great detail, which we never get from politicians. We get very polished answers. He's not someone who's critical of the monopoly capitalism we have in the United States, and Mm -hmm. I think that's essential. But I don't think our country is going to change because very smart people, like, who are, you know, the progressive left, explain that there's a better progressive way, and here's the policy plan to working class people. Like, I grew up in a working class family. My, you know, dad works a wage job, and he should be retired. And they can't afford to retire. They can't afford to live on Social Security. This is like a very typical situation for most people in the United States. And seeing how exhausted members of my family are, they also don't like the Elizabeth Warren types. Yeah. She's good. She has good policy ideas. But they don't like being talked down to. It's still this kind of elitism. Yeah, the intellectual elitism is a real fucking problem in in U.S. politics. And that's why Donald Trump keeps winning for two main reasons in my mind Mm -hmm. you you know like feel free to give your two cents on this but one he speaks at a fifth grade reading level everyone can engage a a whole group of people who don't know political jargon can now like get behind an issue and i feel like that's why you always hear like i don't agree with him on everything but he's he's at least saying what other people aren't and i really think that's just people literally saying he's saying what the fuck i i need him to say so i can actually engage in this political discourse Mm -hmm. you know because like so many people who run for office throw in like only buzzwords Mm -hmm. million dollar words every word for the sentence that they're (laughs) using and even people who are very well read are like what the fuck is this guy talking about and it's because they're just trying to signal how smart they are but like if you can't communicate Mm -hmm. effectively you're not as as well versed in this issue as you, you might think you are Mm -hmm. If you can't explain this in one sentence to somebody, Mm -hmm. you're not an expert on this issue, you know? And then the other thing that's unfortunate about Donald Trump that really gives him an edge is that he is unfortunately very funny. Mm -hmm. He is unfortunately hilarious. Yeah. I I wish he had just gone into comedy instead of politics because then people wouldn't really have beef with him the way that they Mm -hmm. do now, even though he's still a terrible person. Maybe people wouldn't know how terrible he is, but unfortunately he is very funny and he is very good at bullying people mm-hmm. and i think that's where he really got hillary clinton is she tried to come up there and you know dish it back at him but she's not fucking funny yeah so it didn't work it just made it look like she really gave a shit about what he was saying and like the mean stuff that he was saying and it would totally derail anything that she was trying to talk about i would really mm-hmm. behoo- behoove anybody who runs against him to be indifferent mm-hmm. towards his jokes Right. You know, instead of rolling their eyes or being like, you see how crazy he is or like trying to be mean back. If people were just like, cool, and then moved on. Mm -hmm. I think that like that's like the best approach you can have to somebody like that is just be like, that was a good joke and then move on. Yeah. No one's done that yet. Yeah. And it's people are in a position where their lives aren't getting much better. But at least Donald Trump has said things like, I'm going to drain the swamp. And so they cast their ballot in that direction. But then he gets into office. And what does he do? He passes tax cuts Mm -hmm. that are... He does not drain the swamp. Yeah, he does not drain the swamp. He passes tax cuts that give corporations a huge break. And Mm -hmm. their permanent tax rates 20% when we have people paying 36% that are American families Mm -hmm. not earning Mm -hmm. billions and millions of dollars like these Mm -hmm. corporations are. And that's really scary. Like, you have this person that is you know, a populist in mm-hmm. rhetoric, but then is governing like an elitist as well. Yeah. And then the Democrats, you have people that are using very smart language, claiming to fight for working people and then not really doing much either. And like not communicating with working people in an effective way. Like when Donald Trump says, I'm going to drain the swamp, people are like, oh, I know what he's talking about. Democrats mm-hmm. might be saying the exact same fucking thing in the exact same fucking debate that you're watching. Mm-hmm. But if they're saying it in like uh, an inaccessible way, you're going to vote for the guy who you think is going to drain the swamp. News to you that it's both people. Mm-hmm. They're both saying that. 
Yeah. Even if neither of them are really effectively doing it. The other problem with anyone getting voted in as president is we have such a huge government Mm -hmm. that it's almost impossible to get people that are trustworthy, that agree with your political agenda in all of the positions so that really your vision for the country can be fully implemented. Like there were a lot of people that were, you know, Republican establishment, lifelong politicians policy people that you know watch the west wing and they're like that's cool that's what i want my career to be like so they work on political campaigns they get appointed to a position in the white house and their opinion is different than donald trump's and it becomes you know a different animal they start implementing what they think is right and people thought trump was cool because he ended up firing a lot of people but then it ended up that we had like no one at the head of cybersecurity, and that was a, a complete disaster problem yeah and a a weak spot it could have been really bad for the united states if someone took advantage of that and so that's a problem as well because i love sean fain i would love for someone like him to run for president but it's like is it possible for him to really implement his agenda without someone who agrees with him at every position of power which is like impossible and like that's what every single president complains about is they're like i came in with these big ideas and i wasn't able to execute any of them Mm -hmm. and like that also just speaks to like the inefficiency of our system yeah if the system is set up where it's impossible to actually like implement any ideas what is anyone supposed to do Mm -hmm. you know yeah but I think we could get someone like Sean Fain who recognizes, like, okay, we need, like, Stephanie Kelton as the head of the Fed or mm-hmm. Rowan Gray. Well, I don't think Rowan can because I don't think he has the citizenship requirements. I believe he's from New Zealand or, no, Australia. Mm. But someone like Stephanie Kelton, if she was willing mm. to do it at the head of the Fed. And, like, not being one of those people that relies on your aides to tell you mm-hmm. important information. Like, we need someone who cares enough about the country to care about appointing people to those positions that are the best for those positions that will ensure the agenda gets passed. Because I really think people who run for office care more about having power than, like, the effect of their power. And how much money they are making. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And I I think people say, like, you know, power corrupts Mm -hmm. to prevent good people from ever wanting it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think you ate. Thank you. Thank you for coming on my podcast, Jessica. Thank you for having me downstairs in your podcast room. Anytime. Is there anything you want to plug while we're here? You guys should watch the weekly-ish news. Hell yeah, you should. Yeah, it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Jessica Burbank, weekly-ish news. K.A. Burbank. K.A. Burbank. Get it done. Daisy, that's the name followed by the chaos.